Welcome to Aurora Public Library's virtual living room, where we are about to experience a night of poetry, music, and song by five fine poets and two wondrous musicians. Tonight's event is presented by Poet Laureate George Elliott Clark with generous funding provided by the League of Canadian Poets. My name is Risha Mandelkorn, and I'll be co-hosting this evening's event with poet Giovanna Riccio. I would first like to offer a land acknowledgement. We are all immigrants and children of immigrants to Canada. We gratefully acknowledge the original caretakers of this land. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. And as we share this space, acknowledging Indigenous nations reminds us of our important connections to this land. I am speaking from the traditional lands and territory of a number of First Nations. This area is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. We all eat out of the same dish and there is only one spoon. That means we have to share the responsibility of ensuring the dish is never empty. Most important, there are no knives at the table representing that we must all keep the peace. As settlers and newcomers, we have been invited into this treaty of peace, friendship and respect. In this spirit, I would like to also offer solidarity with Ukraine in defense of its sovereignty and independence. There is no place for aggression against any sovereign people. In that spirit, we honor all who came before us our own ancestors, as well as all the Indigenous caretakers, named and unnamed, recorded and unrecorded. Before we start, I'd like to point out a few tech details. Tonight's event is being recorded. Most of you are likely on gallery view, but you can easily switch to speaker view during a reading or performance by clicking on the top right view box on your screen. And you can also enable closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. Chat has been enabled, so all participants will be able to read the chat. Please keep your comments short and respectful. And participants, if you would like to chat back with our guests, that would be wonderful. And I was thinking, because we're actually going across the whole country this evening, that if you are putting something in the chat, why don't you add where you're from? Because I know we have everybody from the East Coast through the West Coast up and down, and it would be really interesting to see how far that our words and music are taking us this evening. So everybody, please sit back, relax, grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine as I introduce George Elliott Clark and invite him to speak to the genesis of tonight's event. George Elliott Clark begins his website with the words, I'm George Elliott Clark, a poet first, all else second. But aside from being an internationally renowned poet, George is a novelist, playwright, screenwriter, librettist, and scholar. His books have won many honors, including the Governor General Literary Award, the Martin Luther King Jr. Achievement Award, and the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Fellowship Prize. George was appointed to the Order of Canada in 2008 and served as Canada's seventh Parliamentary Poet Laureate. It is my great honor to welcome George Elliott Clark. Hello everyone, and Richa, thank you so much. And Aurora Public Library, thank you so very, very much. Lucy Frechette as well, handling the technical side of things. I am just bursting with joy because it's April number one. Uh, number two, because of the fact that we are doing the fourth Five Poets Breaking Into Song tonight uh, with the powerful uh, support of the Aurora Public Library and again, uh, Richa uh, Mandelkorn. And, and uh, so as we've done in the previous three incarnations, we will be presenting five fine poets uh, whose works have been uh, put to music uh, one song each, or two songs in the case of Astrid Bruner, by the inimitable uh, uh, James Rolfe, uh, composer extraordinaire, accompanied by the most marvelous, fantastic, 
technically sophisticated video maker and composer and pianist who is Juliet Palmer right here in Toronto, both of them. And they are going to share uh, their, their music, uh, their love for poets and poetry uh, with everyone who's watching. Uh, and and uh, I am going to introduce both of them uh, right now, but I also just want to say how glorious it is, how glorious it is that we have this evening together as we fight through uh, the rest of the pandemic and as we wish for peace, true peace everywhere, all over the earth. So I want to begin by uh, mentioning uh, Juliet Palmer, who actually doesn't need much of an introduction, ladies and gentlemen. Her music, and the reason why I say that is because you will find her music, or you could have found her music, heard her music, on a highway off-ramp. How do you like that? A, in a swimming pool. A boxing ring. Absolutely. And, and in concert halls across North America, Europe, and Oceania from Antuirara, uh, New Zealand, uh, and forgive my pronunciation, Juliet, uh, Juliet Palmer makes her home here in Toronto. And, and I follow the introduction of, of Juliet with the introduction of James Rolfe. Uh, composer James Rolfe's music has been commissioned and performed by ensembles orchestras, choirs, and opera companies in Canada and internationally, and recognized with a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Jules Leger Prize, and Dora and Juno Award nominations, and James Rolfe also lives here in Toronto. I'll also just say very quickly how happy I am that the very fine poet, Giovanna Riccio, is also a host, our co-host this evening. So please enjoy everyone, and, and uh, uh, you'll, you'll find this, this evening absolutely uh, uh, in, inimitable by anyone, anywhere, anytime. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. So my co-host this evening is Giovanna Riccio, and Giovanna is a graduate in philosophy from the University of Toronto. Her poems and other writings have appeared in numerous anthologies, magazines, newspapers, and journals, and have been translated into Italian, French, Spanish, and Romanian. Giovanna has read at national and international events, and in 2021 was awarded the Venera Fazio Poetry Prize. Welcome, Giovanna, and I'm going to turn the evening over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Riccia. And uh, thank you to the Aurora Library for hosting us and uh, also to Lucy Freshet for her technical, wonderful technical help to all of us and uh, to the inimitable George, who is very tough to follow as any kind of host with his uh, joyous exuberance and uh, finesse at hosting. So I will not compete with him, but just quietly, quietly do my own thing. So we need to uh, now get on with the show, why we're here. So it is my great pleasure to an announce and introduce our first reader, Boyd Warren Chubbs. Boyd Warren Chubbs hails from Lance Eau Claire Labrador. A true Renaissance man, he is an artist with six solo and 10 group exhibitions, plus 11 select commissions, which include book illustrations. He is also a composer and guitarist with four record releases, a calligrapher and a poet with eight collections to his name. His inimitable poems and illuminated texts remind one of William Blake, and his poetic voice bears the mystical bent of Dylan Thomas. Chops lives in St. John's, Newfoundland. He has met the Queen, and his August artistry balanced well her anointed regality. Boyd 
please. Thank you, Giovanna. A woman is gathering and polishing stones. By that uneasy station of the sea, in the ambivalent region between calm and storm, where the running storm and emerging calm cross into uncertain light and dark, a woman is gathering and polishing stones. Beneath the fast shifting of grays and blues, beneath mist and sun, storm and calm, she is singing, bending above each stone, naming, praising, arranging, raising to the spear brave light, those figures, those old metronomes of a waltzed sea. The stones are gray, silver and blue, oval black and rounded brown, piled in towers and stretching rows, a washed and jeweled necklace of towns. They gather the woman in a brilliant leap, looping her stay where the weather is strange and nothing grows. She works with the cloth and lather and tan is the scarf that's keeping her hair away from her face. Her hands trace along the startling prose, spilling now where she kneels in the sun to trace their veins before the hills die down and stagger fast into mud and ruin or singing goes flat, goes bad, swallowing the brief grace. Between the mist and beautiful riddles, between the emerging calm and stubborn loafing dark, she kneels with her world in her hands, naming the stones. She takes from her eyes the load, condemning their burning shape and tone, revealing their glory, their glory. A shock of goals cries once, then again, carving the dark, and light breaks all through its own suspension, counting as she gathers the fine stones into a stunning curve, places the necklace around the day and heads for home. <clears throat> and now, after the love, at Victoria Street. There's a warm hand upon my head. This land and sea have given a hand to spread upon my head tonight. And I go down to the water to rock and sing of plentiful and certain things. The rapid malt of spring and brooks trees that shook themselves furious, curious phantoms upon the rain path, lane passages of bone and earth, birth of sun dogs and lavender, fogs more delicate than breath, sweat from laughter and a spark and fire, a beautiful liar tender among thieves, sleeves of light climbing the beery hills, and sills handsome with paint and lace, a trace of raw sienna in the swimming tickle, a brace of storms, sermons upon the walking, talking trees, and all around the fossil barrens, cairns above home, the purple gray stone staring, foam with its clothes, rolling the near shore, and a door thinning where, in a mesh of voice and strings, love goes. That's it for me. Okay, now we're going to have James perform that final poem. Okay. There's 
a warm hand upon my head. This land and sea have given a hand to spread upon my head tonight. And I go down to the water to rock and sing of plentiful and certain things. The rapid malt of spring and brooks, trees that shook themselves furious, curious phantoms upon the rain path, lane passages of bone and earth, birth of sun dogs and lavender, fogs more delicate than Sweat from laughter and the spark and fire. A beautiful liar, tender among thieves. Sleeves of light climbing the berry hills. Sills handsome with paint and lace. The traits of raw sienna in the swimming tickle. A brace of storms, sermons upon the walking, talking trees. And all around the fossil barrens, cairns above home. The purple gray stone stairs. its clothes rolling the near shore and a door thinning where in a mesh of voice and strings love goes love goes Thank you very much, Juliet and James and Boyd. Um, you could see just how amazing it is to listen to the poem first and uh, get the, the feeling of the tone of the poetry, the magic of the language, and then to have it set to music. Uh, just what a um, magical collaboration it is. And I want to just uh, say that that is the format we'll be following this evening, is that the poets will have uh, an opportunity to read a poem or two, and then we'll end with the one poem that will be uh, performed by Juliet and James. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for starting us off. And now we're going to go to our next performer, who is the inimitable Louise Bernice Half also named Sky Dancer, who was raised on Saddle Lake Reserve and attended the Blue Quills Residential School. She served as Saskatchewan's Poet Laureate for two years and has traveled extensively for her poetics and to present at numerous conferences. Her books include Bare Bones and Feathers, Blue Marrow, The Crooked Good, Burning in this Midnight Dream, Sokayito, and Oasis, Kinky and Disheveled. She has received numerous accolades and awards, including three honorary doctorates. Louise currently serves as Canada's ninth National Poet Laureate, and she also serves as an elder or knowledge keeper at the University of Saskatchewan and the Saskatchewan Health Authority. She actively participates in cultural and ceremonial activity, activities relevant to her Plains Cree culture. Louise Half, Sky Dancer, lives in Saskatchewan.
Vinashkam, then thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to be interacting with all of you and for the wonderful job that George has uh, pulled from his magical uh, enthusiasm. Thank you, George, and everybody else. Hi, hi. Connecting. I cannot say for sure what happened to my mother and father. The story said she went to St. Anthony's residential school and he went to Blue Quills. They slept on straw mattresses and attended classes for half a day. Mother worked as a seamstress, a kitchen helper, a dining room servant, or labored in the laundry room. Father carried feet for the pigs, cut hay for the cattle, and toiled in a massive garden. That little story is bigger than I can tell. Before them was Nukum and Imusum. She was a medicine woman whose sweat lodge was hidden away, wore prayer beads, and always had a pipe dangling from her mouth. Nimosu had his own car back in the 50s, and he plowed his own land. He was a wealthy man because they lived in a house while we had a cabin. He lifted the sweat rocks for Nukum. That is as far back as I can take you. All the old man said is that I have nothing to weep about compared to them. I know now where the confusion began. She was a tough mistress, that confusion. We were all caught in her web. Her history is covered in blisters, welts, and open sores. You already know that part. We came later. We were the children that mother and father tried, yes, tried to raise. How scared Nemosum and Nukum were. They knew what the priests and the nuns, supervisors, did at those schools. We all left, all of us. Confusion was in our wind. We no longer knew where to turn. That is where my footsteps began, where my footprints appear in snow, in grass. I don't like walking backwards. Old ones haunt my thoughts, tiny spirits that brush the color off my wings. I need them now to help others understand what had happened. It wasn't their fault. It wasn't our fault. Confusion was the ultimate glutton. He came from far away, wore black robes, and carried a crucifix. He was armed with laws, blankets, and guns. He fixed us with a treaty that he soon forgot. Sometimes the end is told before the beginning. One must walk backwards on footprints that walk forward for the story to be told. I will try that backward walk. Stripped. I found myself released from residential school, yet the four walls slittered everywhere I went. I had no regimented call to wake up, line up for breakfast, for dinner, for supper, for school, and no one checking the work I did. There were no boarding school dresses, no TAMs to fight over. I didn't know how to behave didn't know what was expected at the Indian Affairs homes. I was expected to carry on my reading, writing, and arithmetic. I didn't know how to register for class, how to study, how to ask. Silence and humiliation wove my umbilical cord in this new womb. I wandered, calling inside my own name. This last poem that the lovely people made into a song, burning in this midnight dream. I dream I wore a, an X across my chest and down my torso. Granny prints on the midnight whirl, thick lenses moved inside my skull, magnifying, but I could still not see. The X awkwardly signed by my great-grandmother. Another burnt ink into my skin for Treaty 6. 
X for $5 a year allotment, X for medicine, eyeglasses, teeth, and for school. X for every sin, X for moments of grace. The X's of a long paper chain wrap this body. The tattoos beckon me not to surrender, to wear a grizzly cape, to dance until the sun's flames and moonbeams created passion inside my womb. I was earth burning in this midnight dream. And that's now all. Thank you so much. Hi, hi. Thank you so much, Louise. So our poetry that bears the weights and the incredible lightness of the world of our stories. Thank you so much for trusting us with that. And now um, I, I believe Juliet and James have a special presentation of this poem. And uh, we're going to have that now. I dream. I dream, I dream, I wore a skin of X's across my chest and down my torso, Granny Prince of the Midnight World. Thick lenses moved inside my skull, magnifying, but still I could not see. The X, awkwardly signed by my great grandmother, another burnt ink onto my skin for Treaty Six. X for the five dollar a year allotment. X stitched for medicine. Eyeglasses, teeth, and for school. X for every sin. X for moments of grace. The X's of a long paper chain wrapped this whole. Thank you very much. Louise, I wonder if you have any, any response to that uh, presentation there of your very fine poem. Anything you'd like to comment on or say to James and, uh, and uh, Juliet? Well, that was beautifully done. Thank you so much. I, uh, I couldn't have done it. it I, I'm sure it was... Uh, a difficult um, 
a job to to, uh, to put it into music and to then sing it. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Bye. Hi. Uh, thanks so much, Louise. That really um, it means a lot to me. Um, and it's uh, it's really they're really wonderful words to work with. So grounded and clear and connected. Um, and it was no trouble at all to respond musically. Um, and I was sort of in, in in one respect sorry not to sing them myself because I I, I love the words. Um, but I, I was very happy to get a, a woman singer's voice. And Rebecca uh, is a wonderful singer. She's also actually Métis from Winnipeg, I think. Um, so for her, I think it was also a special uh, experience. Juliet, do you want to say anything about what inspired you for the graphics? Yeah. I am. Um... It sort of it came about spontaneously, but I began with that the X, which is in the first half of the poem, such a striking image, and thinking of that on the skin, which is in the the dream that Louise writes about, and then realizing halfway through that it became a circle with the earth and the sun and the moon, and yeah, it was just there's these X's and circles, and it's this beautiful balance in in the midst of all the very rich detailed imagery, those, those two things just uh, came forward for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Louise. Uh, <clears throat> I neglected to ask Boyd if uh, he had anything he would like to uh, comment on uh, with James and Juliet about their rendition of his poem. Boyd, do you want to say something? Um, sure. Um, <clears throat> Just a minute here. Uh, what struck me um, like a brace of storms was the transformation, uh, sound and rhythm, but also the intensity. Um, I know that all things exist that have always existed and will continue to. And from one evidence and then to the next evidence, whatever happens in between, whatever is communicated, whatever is borrowed to put into the new evidence, I'm always fascinated by. And the generosity of James and Juliet and their approach to the sensitivities uh, like the, the chords coming through when fog, more delicate than breath, that lovely, lovely line there, and in the voice that hushes. Uh, those are gorgeous things, obviously, you know, by very, very gifted people, and that helps. <laughs> and, uh, but I am grateful. I am fully grateful. Thanks, boy. That's that's wonderful. Um, I had such fun working with your words, uh, the the rhythm, the cadence, the phrases, the way the phrases are lightly connected with little rhymes here and there, and and most of all, perhaps the imagery. Uh, having visited Newfoundland a number of times, it really it's such a it's like a photograph practically at times. Mm -hmm. The purple gray stone staring the fossil barrens, and um, one thing I, I was conscious to put in was a sense of the waves lapping. Uh, at the shore, because that's mostly when you're Newfoundland, that's it's it's present and it's just a part of the rhythm of life. So, um, thanks for your words. It was a pleasure. Yeah, I hope we can uh, come and perform it in St. John sometime. Yeah, uh, there's a bed. <laughs> there's a bed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say that Boyd is a marvelous uh, uh, artist and he does illuminated texts. And I'm very lucky to have uh, some of my work uh, rendered into his uh, beautiful, beautiful script and, uh, and uh, illuminations. And uh, it strikes me that his poetry is illuminated with all that concrete detail and uh, sonic the the sonic um tension in the poem coming through beautiful beautiful thank you so much to everybody uh so i'm uh now going to introduce our next reader and we are so lucky this evening uh to have 
Andrea Thompson join us. Andrea Thompson is a poet, novelist, editor, and educator who has been publishing and performing her work for over 25 years. In 2009, she was the Canadian Festival of Spoken Words Poet of Honour, and in 2019, her poetry album, Solarations, earned her the League of Canadian Poets Golden Beret Award. Thompson is the co-editor of Other Tongues, Mixed Race Women Speak Out, author of the novel Over Our Heads, and the 2021 recipient of the Pavlik Poetry Prize. Her collection, A Selected History of Soul Speak, was published by Front Frontenac House in 2021 as part of their quartet series. Thank you, Giovanna. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I want to thank uh, Rika, Rika and Lucy from the Aurora Library, and also George, who is a dear friend of mine, who's been a mentor um, and a support to me for years, and um, my brother in poetry. So thank you, George. I'm going to start with a poem about spring. This is called The Great Baptist. I've heard it said that every April, God rewrites the book of Genesis. Streets that were once slush pools of sleet wash clean by rain, the great Baptist. Daffodils and tulips, Gaia's gift, offering promise, a cure to the soul, to all of us disconnected from nature after months spent indoors. Muffled and buttoned, we wandered from one source of central heating to another. Trapped in a rat maze of underground malls, eyes buried beneath shrouds of woolen hats and scarves. Stars with their crisp winter brilliance went dim from inattention. Though some may call it cruelty, this mixing of memory and desire, I will not be fooled by the cold morning air. Because I'm glad for the mud, I'm glad for the rain, I'm glad to leave behind the days of hibernating in the cave. I am glad that this deep freeze is over. This land with its seasons, the wisest of teachers. Where else but the West do we need a lesson so powerful before we will learn how to be released from our own deep freeze? our souls more hospitable to growth, our hearts more willing to open, our love more likely to flow. Tempered by tenacious patience, sunshine becomes more precious. In Demeter's gift of condolence, icicles lose their menace. In celebration of the season, mother nature becomes teacher with daily lessons on how to blossom. So instead of an apple, I offer this poem, prayer, wish, blessing, benediction, that through attention I will learn that clouds are no more than illusion. And I will have the strength to let the rain, let the rain, let the rain come. Wisdom being found in the blue of the sky beyond. I pray to God for sweet release, for more moments of peace. I pray that I may be reborn in this life here on earth, that I may flow smoothly on my path, past the rapids of pain and impediments, and that I may heal my mind by staying in the current. I pray for the end of destruction, for the tsunami force within me to find its expression in compassion. I once read that April comes in like an idiot, babbling and strewing flowers. May I be blessed by the love of such a fool, be washed clean by his rain, drenched in his splendor. Okay, so the next one is called Wound Turned to Light. The light of witnessing existence makes everything beautiful again, brings rebirth to those disowned parts of self, those shattered fragments the world deems unworthy, those darkened days and tired nights of soul-deep weariness 
become refreshed through the act of simply recording what is, what it is to be ourselves, unabashed, naked, living on this crushed ball of stardust, what it is to be us, hurtling through the universe, bouncing up against each other like ideological pinballs at a time when the polarity of this planet has sent us all off on our own diametrical trajectory away from the core, when the weight of interpersonal animosity has become crippling, when the term respectfully disagree is about to become extinct. In this moment, I bow down and thank God for the gift of creativity, for endowing all of us humans a life-giving method of release to the pressures of simply existing, a way to translate pain into beauty, a way to open up the valve on it all and begin to let off steam. What a gift it is to be given this moment, to be invited to express all of the colors of this jagged emotional palette without judgment, to simply say yes. Yes to the raw red of rage, yes to the yellow of hope, yes to the bruised hearted blues, yes to unfathomable purple, yes. Yes, 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 and amen to it all. Thank you. Powerful, Andrea, thank you so much. Okay, James, you're on. James and Juliet, you are next. Okay, thanks. We'll take it away. The light of witnessing existence Makes everything beautiful again Brings rebirth to those disowned parts of self Those shattered fragments the world has deemed unworthy Those darkened days and tired nights of soul deep weariness become refreshed the act of simply recording what is, what it is to be ourselves, unabashed and naked, living on this crushed ball of stardust, what it is to be us, hurtling through the universe, bouncing up against each other, like ideological pinballs at a time when the polarity of this planet has sent us all off on our own diametrical trajectory away from the core when the weight of interpersonal animosity has become staggeringly crippling when the term respectfully disagree is about to become extinct in this I bow down and thank God for bestowing us with the gift of creativity, for endowing all of us humans a life-giving method of release to the pressures of simply existing, a way to translate pain into beauty, a way to open up the valve on it all and begin to let off steam. What a 
gift it is to be given this moment to be invited to express all the colors of this jagged emotional palette without judgment to simply say yes to the raw red of rage yes to the yellow of hope, yes, to the bruised hearted blues, yes, to the unfathomable purple, yes, 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 and amen to it all. Thank you, James. That was breathtaking. I can't, I just can't talk about how wonderful it is to hear your poems put to music. It just transforms them and all of a sudden you feel like a different kind of artist, like you've become a lyricist or, or been transformed into a new stage of your poetry life. So thank you so much, George and uh, James and Juliet for uh, that gift. So at this time now, uh, what I would like to do is uh, to have George talk a little bit about how uh, this idea of five poets, the series breaking into uh, song uh, came about. But before we do that, let me ask Andrea if she would like to uh, comment on her response to uh, Juliet and James' uh, performance of her very, very fine poem. Sure, Giovanna, thank you. Um, wow, that was incredible. It was so cool to hear, hear them performing um, live. And it just really struck me the, the layers of emotion and the different kind of emotional cadences that they they moved through it was like all of the emotions <laughs> all kind of in the in the process of the poem and um and then hearing again the circling back at the end that um that's that that musical interpretation of an easiness and that you know musical interpretation of delicacy um yeah, it was really rich. That was beautiful, Julian. James, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Um, it's wonderful. I mean, <laughs> it's the first time I've seen you live, so to speak. It's a funny collaboration um, because I, I really know you through your words, um, and uh, which I really was drawn to, um, and especially this this particular um, poem. Um, and it it really jumped off the page for me. Uh, on, I think there were two points of connection. One was the sense of of phrasing and rhythm, which I've mentioned before with the other poets, but also that there's a really deep spiritual connection, I think, here that's being made to our present time and trying to put the sense of wonder and creativity that so many of us struggle to uh, access. Um, you know, uh, people from all backgrounds and all ages deal with that. And uh, I think it's, you know, the medium of art be it words or music or other art is is uh, that's the most wonderful thing I think about it is that it puts you back in touch with something that's deep within yourself and um, that we in our lives don't value enough perhaps. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I it's it's a great responsibility and trust that. Uh, James takes on and Juliet as well to uh, take a poem and then uh, try and translate all the shifts and turns and uh, the personal uh, investment and uh, beyond that into music and you do it so uh, so wonderfully and successfully James and Juliet thank you so much. And now I'd like to turn it over to George uh, so that he can share with us a little bit about how this whole series came about. Well, uh, thank you. Okay. We, need, we need your camera. Can you, um, can you, uh, George, turn okay, on your camera? I will start, I will start my video. 
Yes. Here we are. Hello. I've got an echo. <laughs> but so I will just be succinct and to the point. How did this all start? This wonderful evening that we are having right now began because of my uh, Christmas present with the collusion. I got to use that Trump noun, the collusion of James Rolfe in agreeing with me to help me present a special Christmas gift to our co-host tonight, uh, Giovanna Riccio. Uh, and this is for Christmas uh, 2020. And, and uh, so I secretly uh, went through uh, Giovanna's uh, uh, works of poetry and selected a, a handful, uh, I don't know, maybe a dozen or so, uh, and and uh, and it was hard to make the selection. I I, I got to say, and and then I sent that work uh, to James, and asked him to choose something that spoke to him, that would be a good uh, a song that he could well make music for, and and um, uh, he did choose the one poem that I was really passionate about in terms of, of having a song made out of it. Because when I read it, uh, and I've never heard Giovanna recite it for me. So I read it myself, I, I read it out loud, I read it silently, and that poem is namesake. And it's about how uh, Ms. Riccio, uh, back in the day when she was called Joan, uh, made a visit to Rome, Italia, Roma, Italia, and heard her name as Giovanna, her actual birth name, shout it from the balconies, shout it from the taxis, shout it from the streets, shout it in the bars and the restaurants, and realized that she had to reclaim her actual Italian birth name, forget about all of the uh, Anglophone Canadian attempts to anglicize her. No, she was going to reclaim this powerful name, which of course is Joan in English, but Giovanna, such a wonderful uh, sounding name. Uh, so anyway, uh, James, luckily for me, also chose that poem as one he wanted to put music to. And this was December, 2020 once again. And we managed, we managed to surprise Giovanna on Christmas day, 2020, by having her poem uh, sung back to her uh, as I managed to finagle her to get in front of the laptop uh, uh, that morning to hear this piece. Uh, and it was sung by my cousin, Sheila White, um, who is the niece of the great African-Canadian uh, uh, singer, uh, unfortunately uh, deceased, uh, but great uh, singer, uh, Portia White, uh, who lived 1911 to 1968. But anyway, uh, Sheila certainly has inherited uh, our uh, our ancestors pipes uh, and was able to uh, uh, present the song to an amazed and startled and very surprised Giovanna on Christmas morning 2020 and seeing how delighted everybody was Sheila James me Giovanna we were all so delighted with this with the reaction to the song that I went back to James and said, look, would you mind doing another song uh, based on a poem by a, a friend of mine, Paul Zemeco? And, and James turned in Moon. Wow, it's, a, it's, a, it's like namesake, such a powerful, powerful song. And then once that happened, we started to be on a roll. And, and, uh, and I started to ask uh, for, for other uh, uh, poets, uh, poems to be transformed into song. And, and we've now done, I've lost track, I admit, I've lost track, but I think we've now done, oh, maybe close to 10. Uh, and James has, has also thrown in a couple of freebies, which is all right. I don't mind talking about the fact that, that these are also commissions. Uh, this is, uh, in terms of myself as a poet, uh, as someone who, who has a, 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 a you know, an acceptable income given to me on on behalf of uh, the taxpayers of Ontario and Canada. And I bow to you all. I bow to all Canadian taxpayers and Ontario taxpayers uh, for supporting the arts in this way, supporting me too, 
as I get ready to retire, I hope, while still living. Uh, and and uh, But to be serious, I, I think that all of us who can have to give back to the arts, especially right now. I mean, look at the headlines are nothing full are full of nothing but turmoil and disaster. Turmoil and disaster. It doesn't matter what your politics are, you're gonna get turmoil and disaster. That's human history. So this way of doing poetry and music with gifted composers like James, and I'm also working with Dee Dee Jackson. I also did a song with Emily Hemstra. Look at you can't get better than this. Now, Giovanna asked me to just talk about how this project got started, so I have, I'm going to shut up in a second, but I will say this again. This is our fourth, tonight is our fourth presentation of poets with poems put to music. Every single one of them has, has just been dynamic and beautiful and great, and I, and I really uh, tip my invisible hat for, off my very visible afro to all the composers I've been so privileged to work with. Uh, again, James Rolfe, Dee Dee Jackson, Emily Hamstra, and especially to the poets. Uh, and, and tonight, also to Aurora Public Library, I am now gonna shut up and, and thank uh, everybody for your attention and your love of these performers, your love of these songs, and they need your love, we need your love. Uh, we are so happy to be able to this evening to you. And I know that Astrid is now in the house, as is Anna Yin. So back to you, Giovanna. Thank you so much. Uh, I was going to step in with my poem, Namesake, in case, uh, wait. I, I was going to step in with my poem, Namesake, in case uh, uh, we didn't have our uh, next two performers appearing, but here they have arrived. And uh, I just want to say about changing, having uh, one's name changed when uh, you're registered as a child in school, it's very confusing. And I just heard of uh, a, a uh, person on Instagram who has a page called The Story of Our Names. She's a Chinese Canadian who also changed her name and then reclaimed it. So it's a going thing. And I'm happy, uh, I'm happy to have participated in the reclamation. But now I am going to introduce our next uh, reader. And Astrid Bruner has gone across to Dartmouth from her home so she could be here with us because there was a a power uh, outage in Halifax. Astrid, thank you so much for making the effort. So I'm going to introduce Astrid Bruner, who writes, Phoenix is an orphan from the ashes of World War II Germany. Writing soon became the missing home and family. In both English and German, it took many forms. Arts and theater, journalism, translating, performance and academic texts, book publishing, photography, biographical anthology, short stories, aphorisms, poetry. The video, Marlene in Academe, scripted, produced, directed, performed, may best illustrate the tragicomedia dell'arte curriculum vitae of my writing. Bruner lives in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Astrid, it's all yours. Hello. Astrid, uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, okay. There we are. sorry. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm full of technical problems tonight, but I'm in Dartmouth now, not in Halifax. <laughs> anyway, I made it thanks to friends. So here I am. So shall I just start my reading then? So uh, I was thinking uh, of, uh, this probably is an aphorism, could be, maybe an epitaph as well. It's really a, a little thing that I wrote recently, uh, addressed really uh, to the dog of one of the murderers of my husband. And it goes like this. The other oh, dog's name is Rufus. And you have to imagine a dog sort of like a, a a Jack Russellish kind of dog who should wear a Roman 
uniform, a Roman soldier's uniform, I think that's sort of the way I think of him. Anyway, this is very, very, uh, it's just basically to, to um, say goodbye to my husband, which I never, never was able to do. Um, so dear Rufus, I hope you, you all become acquainted with grief in the fullness of time as my by you and yours murdered beyond death to as part husband used to say. So that's one. And um, there's one other thing, and then I want to, to go to more cheerful things. Um, basically the abduction and the, and the murdering of my late husband uh, also included the, the theft of our lovely lake property in New Brunswick. And uh, and then I had to go to the law just to get rid of of these people out of my life at least. And but I was I was um, interested in in finding in a book that I published in that, that was published in two thousand and three called On the Night the Flowers Caught Fire, a little thing I would call that an aphorism uh, about law and courts. And I'm going to read that to you. Um, the courtroom, they say, is locked now, the courthouse crumbling. The other day, as they passed quickly, pulling their collars up about their ears, just then a bird flew into the windowed front of the courthouse and dropped like any stone. And no mistress quickly to lament it. And with this allusion to Shakespeare, I um, well, I love both languages. I love writing uh, both languages, German and and uh, English. And Shakespeare is certainly my justification for having learned English. I started when I was about twenty three. I didn't know English when I came to this country, but um, then eventually I learned it. And uh, so I want to uh, read you. This is the light here is a bit different from what I had set up in my office, so I have to sort of look to the side here a bit. Um, it's from a book called My Aji, My Pericles. Now, Pericles is one of my favorite Shakespeare plays, perhaps because people talk about you know it's it's really been written by two people and there is Gower who is sort of the the, the person who connects these things anyway Ashi is this person I uh, rescued in Switzerland from the gutters he eventually had about four years from beginning to end he died of cancer but I want to uh, read two poems one in each language and uh, relating to the Pericles theme no, indeed, and though I am at most Shakespeare's sister, you yet were my gower, my chorus, the accomplisher of my life's play. Finally, then, our divine unity proves it, my Shakespeare. Now I am your gower, your chorus. I stand guard at the customs barriers of your life's play, the borders of its acts and scenes. Now I'm going to do this in German. Nein, keineswegs. Und obwohl ich allerhöchsten Shakespeare's Schwester bin, so war so doch mein Gauer, mein Chor, der Vollender meines Lebensstücks. Schlussendlich dann unsere göttliche Einheit, Einheit beweist es, mein Shakespeare. Jetzt bin ich dein Gauer, dein Chor. Ich stehe wache an den Sollschranken deines Lebensstücks, der Übergängen seiner Akte und Szenen. And one more from this theme because of the two languages and, uh, and because of Pericles and Shakespeare, my love for Shakespeare. And it actually starts with a quotation from the play. Sir, I will use my utmost skill in his recovery. This is um, Thaisa talking, Thaisa is uh, Pericles' wife who's been lost for years and then eventually they find each other at the end and she has become um, a votress of Diana, the goddess Diana. And so, let's see, no, <laughs> I want to read it in English first. Then, uh, 
No Neptune nor Zeus could have so sea tossed, so bad lightning enlightened me as did you during that pure night with your Pericles silence. Thus my music, long years since put up in fusty disuse, thus my music came back to me, to your wave tossed sea interred, your Thaisa, how I then wrapped my prophet's livery, the Argentine around me, how I tuned my lyre before the altar became Diana yours and your liturgy. In German now, uh, nicht Neptun, nicht Zeus, hätten mich so umtreiben, so bestürmen und blitzartig erleuchten können, wie du es an jenem Abend in jener Nacht mit deinem Perikles schweigend tatest. Ich kam mir die Musik, weder die ich weltumtrieben, seebegraben, Thaisa dir Jahre zuvor an den Nagel gehängt, da tat ich mir das sehr gewandt um, das Mondlichte, stimmte mir die Leier ein vor dem Altar, wurde Diana dir und Liturgie. So that's my Shakespeare. Uh, and now I... Um, before I read the, the poems that uh, James has set to music so beautifully, and I, I told him before that when I, when I heard his um, YouTube rendering of that, the sort of opposites there, one has me in tears at the end, and the other one has me laughing. So it's, uh, anyway, um, but before that, I want to read a few aphorisms, and then I will read um, the the one that she, the, the James the, the two pieces come from a complete piece called um, um, a suite in B minor, and it's uh, it's about Mary Magdalene. It's, it's stories and so on. We took two poems out of that, and one is the, the prelude, and the other one is the minuet. Uh, one, and I'm going to read the minuet two before I read the minuet one and then the, uh, the prelude and the minuet one. But here, just a few aphorisms. I love aphorisms and I, I, I find them addictive. I don't sort of like um, shorthand for my philosophical thinking, maybe my being. Uh, I don't really know, but I find them amusing. I find them, I don't think I'm vicious. But I do like to be um, sarcastic now and then. So let me see which um, it's this light here is a bit less than in my office. So such gorgeous, gaudy lies for enchanted riders like us, fleeting away the time carelessly on high surfing waves dicing away Christ's rope with the best of them under the cross on the, on the hill called Schädelstedt, frousting away the flowers with debauches, high-stepping through the seven deadly sins and back galliarding to the tune of a healthful sweat with the seven ages of man till the ultimate curtain comes down to everybody's satisfaction. That's um, actually from a book called On the Night the Flowers Caught Fire. It's dedicated to Carol Fraser, who was quite an, who was an amazing painter and the wife of an amazing English professor uh, who taught me a lot of English and especially about early 20th century. And anyway, I adore him and I owe him a lot. So just, this is the courtroom one. So, um, This morning, forgetting last night's conflagrations and perilous tightropes of urbanity, the world went on unowned, visiting the scenes of its past. This evening, remembering it all, no longer unowned, the world returned from visiting the scenes of its past, and its eyes shone en couleur de feu, feuille morte, its eyes, the color of dead leaves. I'm just leaving through this, these aphorisms here. So I'm going to two or three more, and then I'll go to the minuet.
though I split my tongue every time I speak, they, with their peculiar brand of being gracious, have not yet melted. Egypt into the Nile, not yet melted, Egypt into the Nile, but then music is moody food for those of us that trace, oh God, I can't really see, trade in love for, okay, let me do this again. Egypt melted into Egypt, Egypt into the Nile, but then music is moody food for those of us that trade in love, for those of us that trade with rich intent in uncertain harmonics. So maybe with this musical reference, I will uh, switch to the minuet two, which is part of the suite of, uh, of which um, minuet one prelude that James set to music. So this is minuet two that isn't set to music. I tease you in English, never fear, to drink my passion out of my dancing shoes. I tease you in French, never fear, to drink my blood out of my dancing shoes. I tease you in Russian, never fear, to reach me the sequin light from my glass chandelier. I tease you in Cree, never fear, to ladle me the silver glamour from the harbour into my earthenware bowl. I tease you in Spanish, never fear, to fetch me my virgin silk dresses from the slim church spires up the hill. I tease you in Latin, never fear, to hold above the crowd my flaming hair, my red, red heart, while you compose a Santa Maria Magdalena for the glorious defunct cathedral masses of your timeless saintly heart. Um, I had meant to write, to read something from Roll Silk, but maybe we don't have the time. I don't really know whether we have the time. But um, anyway, so now I'll read, uh, if James is ready, I'll read uh, the prelude of what he has set to music. Okay, so, so this is the prelude, and it's for the Mary Magdalene, a suite in B minor. Prelude. She sees the roses, excuse me, that's the wrong text because we edited it actually. So I'm, I'm reading it from the, when we edited the poem before setting it to music. She sees the crimson roses wither and fall petal by petal into the ashes of her heart. Let us be friends, says Mary Magdalene. She hears the ambered stars wither and fall flame by flame into the ashes of her heart. Let us be friends, says Mary Magdalene. She feels the ruby blood ooze and fall teardrop by teardrop into the ashes of her heart. Let us be friends, says Mary Magdalene. She knows the phoenix sleep and fall red by gold by blue into the ashes of her heart. Let us be friends, says Mary Magdalene. She unfolds her scarlet hair and waits patience by patience by patience over the ashes of her heart. Let us be friends, says Mary Magdalene. I'll go forward to James. Okay, James and Juliet, thank you so much, Astrid. We'll be back to you in a second. It's so good to thank see you. <laughs> sees the crimson roses wither and fall petal by petal into the ashes of her heart let us be friends says mary magdalene She hears the amber 
the stars wither and fall flame by flame into the ashes of her heart let us be friends says mary magdalene she feels the ruby blood ooze and fall teardrop by teardrop into the ashes of her heart let us be friends says mary the phoenix sleep and fall red by gold by blue into the ashes of her heart let us be friends says mary She unfolds her scarlet hair and waits patience by patience by patience over the ashes of her heart. Let us be friends, says Mary Magdalene. Let us be friends, says Mary Thank you so much for that marvelous performance. Uh, Astrid, do you want to make any comment on that uh, rendition of your poem? Yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Can no, I think we should. Turn on your camera, Astrid. There we go. No, I think to just go into the minuet. And then James and Juliet can can do that too because they're really sort of pieces that belong together. Uh, uh, James made them so really, and uh, so this one should cheer us all up a bit, I think. So uh, so let me read it, and they can perform it, and then we can talk. Is that a, is that alright? Yeah. Okay. So I'll start with with the minuet. Minuet one now. The the minuet to a friend. So I do that. And although I want to go out into the snowstorm to stand there naked and shout my love for you into the white howling wind, I too can write a letter or two with this and that in it. And although I want to go out into the snowstorm to stand there naked and fly into your arms through the white howling wind, I too can write a letter with this and that in it. And although I want to ride into the snowstorm and shake my mane there naked and ride into your body laughing on horseback at the white howling wind, I too can write a letter with this and that in it. And although I want to ride into the snowstorm to melt my body naked into yours, from the ice in your eyes, I have turned into mighty water with the heat of my love. Should the ice return to the snowstorm, to my naked body, I too can write a letter with this and that and a saint or two in it. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And although I want to go out into the snowstorm To stand there naked and shout my love for you Into the white howling wind I too can write a letter with this and that in it And although I want to go out into the snowstorm to stand there naked and fly into your arms through the white howling wind, I too can write a letter with this and that in it. And although I want to ride into the snowstorm to shake my mane bare naked and ride into your body, laughing on horseback into the white howling wind, I too can write a letter with this and that in it. And although I want to ride into the snowstorm to melt my body naked into yours from the eyes in your eyes I have turned into mighty water with the heat of my love Should the ice return to the snowstorm to your eyes to my knees Good body, I too can write a letter with this and that, and a saint or two in it. Thank you so much, James and Juliet. Uh, Astrid, do you want to make a quick comment? Uh, on everything, or <laughs> no, just uh, just on these two on uh, these two performances of your. The, I mean, actually, yes, I do. With regard to the music, anyway. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? With regard to the music. Yeah, because the, uh, James actually brought this out as a like I didn't know I could be so sad and so funny, which is awfully nice to see that. And James brought this out, so I'm it really was enriching. And also, actually, I want to to say something to Juliet as well. When I first saw it, she interprets everything with her face. It's really quite funny. <laughs> I just, you can really- you know, It's funny because you, you don't see my hands playing the piano because of this. No, but it's, it's all there in your thing. face. And it's like, you, you, you can tell when you're sad, but then you, and I remember you cracking up when, when you did the first time, the, the funny one. So that was really, you actually interpreted what I wrote years ago. In fact, it was part of a, I was teaching in Newfoundland at the Memorial University, that was in the mid nineties. And it was a project, class project really. And that, that was my contribution to it. And, and so that is so long ago. And then when when uh, George asked me to to send something for composition, I um, I, I photographed it from a book. And then... mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have to say uh, it was a pleasure to reconnect with uh, Astrid because we met way back in 1990, 32 years ago at the Banff Leighton Artists Colony. We were fellow uh, artists there and um, hadn't had really not stayed in touch. And then all of a sudden, these poems. And it was kind of great to uh, delve back in. And again, the words are so lively um, and they have such momentum as well. And, and for a composer, that's, that's a wonderful thing to work with, that sense of moving forward. And they're high stakes, you know, uh, they take no prisoners. And I, I appreciate that. Again, to sing, you really have to have something to sing about. So it's there in the words. Thank you. Thank you both. Wonderful. All right. We are now at our finale this evening with another Poet Laureate. Wow. We were graced with three this evening. And so I'm going to now introduce Anna Yin. Anna Yin was Mississauga's inaugural Poet Laureate and has authored five poetry collections and a book of translations titled Mirrors and Windows published by Granica Editions. Her poems and translations have won awards and appeared in Art Poetry Magazine, The New York Times, Queen's Quarterly, 
the China Daily, and CBC Radio, to name a few. She teaches the Poetry Alive workshop and lives in Mississauga, Ontario. Hello, you can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you, yeah. Good. Okay, good, okay. Okay, so, okay, yes. And uh, I'm so glad to be here. And uh, I, I'm sure everyone enjoy, enjoy the poetry and the music and as I did, right? So I will, I will read two poems related to music as well. And uh, so, uh, the first poem I read is uh, like uh, is uh, the title "The Small Wonder," and uh, it was chosen for the Poetry in Place anthology for this year. And also, and I wrote this poem when I also thought about Rim Softer. Rim, I in two thousand in two thousand twelve, I did a. Uh, I, I organized an event to tribute to Rim Sartre and when he was more than uh, eight, 90 years old, 90 years old. And um, I, in my presentation, I quoted, and Rim Sartre once said, poise should be like a, a bird, always sing, no matter the weather. So this is my poem, Small Wonders. My great grandma once told me, there is a life tree in the east where birds sing all seasons. I've long forgotten it or lost faith in it. Sitting beside my gilded screen to forge a song shrush, a button is what I need to click. Yet the singing from this magic fails to bring the story be back. This morning, into Bull's Point Loop, where Lake Ontario is near, and the Six Nations people once looked out, I pause at bird signs and tiny feeders, colorful and beautiful in still pauses. Each teaches me a name. American goldfinch, rose-breasted, cross, cross beak, blue jay, blue jay, cardinal, scarlet tanager, red-tailed shrush, and yellow warbler. Morning, little birds, I call out, my eyes searching into the deep, among lush leaves and rosy buzz. I cannot chase their flight, but I hear song after song, full of joy, full of freedom, burst from them, burst from myself. Morning, little birds, a world of small wonders, we sing to each other. So, I want to share another one is from my second poetry collection, Inhaling the Silence. So this one is also titled The Night Song. The Night Song. Speechless, the moon rises, the pine tree stretches its tip. A thin veil casts down like a spell. Warm breezes flutter shaded leaves, lips shiver, arrows fling upon the river, a melodrama stirs the moon's mirrored face. Two cranes take off, two cranes take off, you rise and sing. Thank you all, and also thank you, Joanna, for the, your wonderful introduction. Thank you. And next, I think we cannot wait to hear tonight's Nightingale, our musician, right? James, to sing again, right? So I will, turn, I will turn this to Joanna and Joanna and James. Thank you. We cannot hear you. 
Thank you so much, Anna. It's terrific to hear those songs praising birds who bring us so much and are so endangered. Uh, thank you. Now it's, we'll turn it over to James and Juliet. In Prospect Cemetery Among a poplar, cedar, maple I hope you found your tree A healing from heaven Here in another city I see from my window a full-grown willow Ten years ago It was a tiny twig Dropped in the valley Two years ago The year you passed Lightning hit the willow and split her into a year later from the open wound she grew new branches have i found my spirit tree A breeze blows, new green leaves touch me like a soft hand. When winter comes, I collect the fallen leaves, slim the shape of lips. I slip them into books of your poems They cling to one another A whispering forest of stories A whispering forest of stories Giovanna, you're on mute. <sighs> Forgetting to unmute myself. So sorry. Uh, Anna, would you like to say a few words uh, to James and Juliet? Or yes. uh, make any comments on their uh, musical presence? Yes, yes, yeah. I'm so, oh, I'm so touched. Yeah, this, yeah, because uh, this poem, and I should read this poem, Spirit Tree, it's, um, it's a, uh, it's a tribute to another poet. She died very young. She's so talented, and uh, and I I actually I tran I translated her poem, and I was so touched. She talked, she talked uh, to a tree as uh, she tried to find the a spirit tree and to, for healing because she she had the she had the disease right. So she tried to feed. Uh, find the healing, find the process. And I really like uh, James to, to render it, render the sadness, render the missing, and render the, like, uh, like the hanging, right? We, we try to hold, hold the feeling, hold the emotion together. So yeah, this is uh, my poem also like that. I also tried, I also go, ran through some like uh, health issue, right? So I also wanted to, find the healing. So yeah, uh, thank you, James, to bring 
bring all the you know the the emotion and the the hope the quietness the hope there so thank you it was it was my pleasure, Anna. Thanks for the words. Um, you're absolutely right. There, I found in it a stillness, a quietness, and that was all the more remarkable because obviously, I, again, the stakes here were high. Um, that we were talking about um, life and death, um, and yet it is delivered. Uh, the words render it a. Um, they transcend. They really transfigure um, mm -hmm. the, 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 these things of life and death and put it into a, a place of uh, stillness and, and beauty, which I think we can all appreciate. So, Giovanna, yes, as your as your as your co-host, I'm going to suggest that even though we've had the pleasure of hearing from five 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 fine poets and two wondrous musicians. And although our night seems to be at an end, we cannot close off without hearing poetry by the amazing George Eliot Clark. So we need, to, we need to bring George on and we need to have him read and he may not be prepared to read, but George is always prepared for everything. So George, would you come and please and send us out with your wondrous words? But you have to unmute. Unmute, George. Mute. Okay. Thank you, Giovanna. I, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think that's about five, four or five times uh, to everybody uh, for uh, tonight. Uh, Anna, that's such a wonderful poem. Uh, James, what a terrific rendition of that poem in music. Giovanna and Richia, what wonderful hosting tonight. You're crying out loud. I want you both to be presiding over the next federal budget. No matter what uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau brings up tomorrow, I know you would do a better job, both of you together. I want to call on you both to give us a new budget as soon as possible, no matter what the government says tomorrow, because they don't count. You count. They don't count. Anna, thank you so much for that poetry. It's just great. Uh, and, and James and Juliet, you always bring it. You always bring the music for crying out loud. It's, it's nonstop excellence. But... I'm here in Richia. I know we got to end up soon. So here we go. Um, uh, this is a, a, a new uh, poem and uh, a new song that uh, James has done uh, for me. And, and uh, um, he calls it uh, bombastic. Bombastic. As I've been accused of being, but I'm not the bombastic person here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blame the politicians. The politicians are always bombastic, but librarians and poets, we just bring flowers and light and music. And, and that's all we do. We just bring flowers and light and music, enlightenment and flowers and music. That's what librarians and poets and composers do. The politicians are bombastic. So look out. Be careful. Whenever you hear the bombast, run for cover. Run! And I'm channeling uh, Muhammad Ali as I say that. <laughs> but here's the poem. Uh, gigabyte size letdown. A signally colossal pygmy, a hunchbacked Igbo Igor. Talent worth less than a cheeker plagued pig. Talent that's only a figment of my Pygmalion. Gigolo vocab itself not big. I'm ultra vires, illegal, not worth a fig, and unlike a wig, infra dig, beneath ink's crabby dignity, thus my ignominious verses don't signify. Alluding to my obligatory pigment, my oil crude, black ass nib zigzags these white sheet gig. My squibs unniggardly yet niggling see my mag nagging ego, jag and jig. 
Under my malignant signature, no squirts of MIG-21 shat napalm bomb wrigglings, fry eagles, big beagles, or eyeballs ignite. What good's digging at my squigglings? But I'm not significantly polygamist, vigorous, opening my friggin' spigots of ink, migrescent, not even when I'm lurled a nigger like rights bigger, not A. A. Milne's tigger. But I swear, how could I renege the apartheid brig or win higgledy piggledy a stig Larson cigar? Dark as a Klieg light beamed ponder spiegel, I mind bards at whom all colleged colleagues snigger. Always was I an ignoramus like Captain Quig, minger if eager to league as a worthy figure, the Antigone of Antigonish who ligatures together earthy swigs of igneous molten spittle grammar beleaguered. I was less zealig than Rigoletto. Unambiguous roared the guffaws as if lauding Folly's zig field. Dervishes all whirly gigs in trigonal shin digs and applause symphonic Edward Grieg contiguous. What a stigma my intrigue be, what ignorant and brazen bigotry to vaunt Negro rigs, these foul spell triggering sprigs, if he schlock to spiffy, be wigged, proof rock like prigs. In this poem, and now song, uh, thanks to James and Juliet, has this opening. The problem is I'm bombastic, drastically bombastic, due to the minstrelsy buffoonery of being a yellowed cartoon black, a secondhand black, a kind of discard discounted black, being really only tan or brown, a souvenir of miscegenation. No wonder I won't do. I won't keep sordid crossbreed as I am, a sordid African hybrid half-breed engine, implacably incapable of excellence, implacably incapable of excellence, implacably incapable of excellence. I'm the descendant of flunkies of the cotton gin, so currently a buck-toothed slave to ungava gin, and I'm as unesthetic as a dumpster. So thank you all so very, very much for your patience. I got to turn it over to the maestri, plural, maestri, James and Juliet. I love you all. You're all so good to be listening to us. Please come back for the next installment. Thank you, Aurora Public Library. And now James and Juliet. Thank you. Thank you, George. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I have to keep the straight paper. Um. The problem is I'm bombastic, drastically bombastic, due to the minstrelsy buffoonery of being a yellowed cartoon black, a second-hand black, a kind of discard discounted black, being really only tan or brown, a souvenir of miscegenation. A signally colossal pygmy, a hunchbacked Igbo Igor, talent worth less than a chigger plagued pig, talent that's only a figment of my Pygmalion gigolo vocab itself, not big, alluding to my obligatory pigment. My oil crude black ass nib zigzags this white sheet gig. My squibs are niggardly yet niggling. See my mag nagging ego jag and jig. Always was I an ignoramus like Captain Queeg. 
meager if eager to leak as a worthy figure. The Antigone of Antigonish, who ligatures together earthy swigs of igneous molten spittle. Grammar a beleaguered. I was less salig than Rigoletto. An ambiguous roared the guffaws as if lauding folly Zeke felt. Dervishes all whirly gigs in trigonal shin digs and applause. Symphonic Edvard Grieg contiguous. What a stigma my intrigue be. What ignorant and brazen bigotry to vaunt negro rigs. These foul spelt triggering sprigs. Iffy schlock. Too spiffy, proof rock like prigs. That was amazing. Oh my goodness. I don't think anybody's going to go to sleep tonight because we just got all this energy <laughs> happening. But actually we, we do have to, uh, we do have to close out. So I'm just wondering if everyone, we'll see what happens with broadband, but can everybody turn their cameras on, whoever's still here, just to take our, to, not an hour, to take your bows, if everybody would kindly turn your cameras on. So from Aurora Public Library. I can thank you all for being part of what was really a literary soiree of the first, you know, the, the best. And uh, I'd like to thank Giovanna Riccio for co-hosting and to say that when we do this again, you will have to read next time because that's just the way it will be. Astrid Bruner, thank you for pursuing and changing towns, if not provinces, in order to get, uh, to get on, on this evening. Uh, Boyd, Warren Chubbs, thank you so much for being with us. Louise Bernice Half had to leave. The time zones are different everywhere, but it was such an honor to have her with us. Andrea Thompson, I just I love your writing. I love your reading. I love listening to you. I do listen to you on video. That's how come I knew what to expect. Anna Yin, you are one of my favorites and certainly one of Aurora's favorites. We love you and composer, musicians, James Rolfe and Juliet Palmer. Thank you, thank you so much for this evening. And I'd especially like to thank George Eliot Clark for enriching our spirits with poetry and the League of Canadian Poets for their generous grant. Thank you to Lucy Frechette for tech support. She's behind all of this, making it happen, coaching us along the way, taking care of the few parachute problems that happened. And to you, our guests, for spending your evening with us. Good night to everyone, and please stay safe. And George, if Giovanna and I are indeed hosting the budget, you will see that the arts <laughs> will get a substantial piece. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everybody. And libraries. And libraries. And libraries, too. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye-bye.